All right, Dan, what's going on? Welcome to the show, Scott Therapy. We're uh, probably episode uh, 21 uh, here in he can the drink. Uh, new studio. Yes, <laughs> we passed some sort of uh, so even marker though I, here. Though I don't drink, it can drink. Well, that's that's a little too heavy for me to understand. You had to break that down. But um, listen, uh, today's topic, we are all... Here's what I was thinking. You're I not. Can't. You're kidding about this. No, topic. no. I, I think it's a topic. Okay. How the, the topic would be is how to learn to live with being a Nazi. How to learn to live while being a Nazi. With being. With being a Nazi. Yeah, the idea is that we're all Nazis. Okay. Well, I know this kind of thing has happened before where we have to break this down just a little bit because there's a little sensationalism that goes on with the with the titles. And uh, no one that I know would like to be called a Nazi Nobody or have would. anything to do with it. And that's, so that, that's the first step that. of learning to live with one, to be with one, to be one. You okay. have to learn to accept the fact that you don't want that. Okay. All right. That makes sense to me. Um, but but um, so you you're – you're talking in, in in one level about trying to understand the 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 vile the the opposite. The, There's something the inherent in Nazism that is constitutive to the subject. Okay. There is something all too human in the the in embedded in any sort of ideology, Nazism or otherwise, that we all have to contend with, and we all have to find a way to move through it to get to where we need to go. That's okay. what I'd say. All right, so it's a it's a work in progress, and we have to figure out ways to uh, mm-hmm. to deal with the things that that uh, upset us and cause us problems, well, or we hate, or have. You and I saw we, we, we saw this too. Jojo Rabbit, didn't we? We did. We saw we we all you know we saw this Jojo Rabbit. Yes, we did. And um, it was um, it 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 had Nazis. In fact. It was about a a kid trying to to be a Nazi and whose imaginary friend is Hitler. That's right. So uh, in that in that movie, uh, he was one of those kids in the uh, not Nazi youth movement, and uh, I think probably all kids were sort of mandated to to do that. I don't know. Not really Could sure. have been like um, you had to be, and uh, they sent you to the camp. This is kind mm-hmm. of a reluctant. Mm. Member actually, maybe he and his friends. They were young and they didn't know what it was all about. Well, but he carried he, he, a lot he of was, anxiety with he it. He was you know? gung ho about it. He was really into this Nazi thing. Yeah, that's true. I guess <laughs> I should rephrase that in he some ways wanted because uh, the, the it, opening, everybody else was, and he was looking forward well, to he, it. He but. was opening up the very opening scene is how he's going to go out. He's this is going to be the best day of his life. He's starting his uh, training as a Nazi, and you know. Okay, maybe I jumped ahead in the movie a little bit there, but yes. Okay, so he's really that. into this. This is this is a thing. Yeah, and in in a way, from that perspective, it was not really something that was uh, uh, portrayed as uh, evil and the kind of things that we've come to know about how people feel about Nazis uh, in in the, and uh, after after all that during and after. So uh, it was a very different perspective from sort of uh, inside the uh, Well, the perspective was, and, and th- this is where the constitutive part is, because Nazism was propped up and, uh, and made um, possible by having an external source that it could, um, it could generate attention with. And this mm-hmm. was the entire Jewish race. In fact, if you'll, the thread off of the film was... Right. You know, and they would talk about how Jews had horns and they laid eggs and the, all this ridiculous thing that they were somehow, right. you know, that they... Um, he had drawn it in his journal, as a matter right. of fact, in those pictures. Yeah. And um, it was it was literally a way to, to, if you could posit that this horrible thing existed, that um, your your ideology and your worldview could be propped up, right? Right. And we talked in here before that that's, that's, that's an element of lots of ideologies. For instance... Not to get political, but if you remember, the very beginning of Trump's campaign was him going down that escalator. Yes. Talking about how Mexicans are rapists. Right. <laughs> so yes. literally, the, the, the whole, you know, that there was this notion that we could take all the issues and problems we have and we could feel whole and complete. 
we could feel like we are on the pathway to some sort of resolution of all our problems if we could identify the right enemy. There's a wonderful... Right. Um, and that's been true throughout wars uh, in general. You paint the other side, right? Okay. And, and there is, um, there's a wonderful book by Vladimir Vulcan. Okay. Not okay. Vulcan. That's a different thing. That, that would be like, you know... That yeah, right. Be, that's, a, that's another... Vulcan. He was, um, he's a psychoanalyst, psychiatrist. I think he was part of the Carter administration in some way. But, um, and the title of the book is The Need to Have Enemies. Okay. And the idea that once again, this that you have an you have um, Great something, title. Yeah, yeah, something like external you can project things into, and so for instance, all through this film, there's this notion that the that someone who's Jewish is somehow vile and horrible, and therefore it allows the German race to be first off a race, mm-hmm. and to be an Aryan race. Its very purity was defined by what it wasn't. We're often, all okay. of us to a degree, are defined by a shadow. And the Jew was the shadow of the German Aryan. And as a result, boom. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, um, yeah, so it, it's going to take, it's gonna take a, a, the, the good and evil. It's gonna, it's gonna, uh, he's talking about you have to have this enemy in order to paint yourself as pure and, and wonderful and uh, basically good throughout. So we need that as a tension. Is that what you're saying? Well, in some ways, it's, it's, when we use the word constitutive, it is part of what makes the subject the subject. And there is a um, a um, an element of that that has to be navigated and attended to for the subject to continue to move. And in some ways, that's what this movie Jojo Rabbit was about. Okay. Because we we don't know for sure. There's some spoilers ahead, right? Because turns out that um, yes, Darth Vader is his dad and. And, um, <laughs> no, no, no. That's a different movie. And um, but yeah, they they, they just took uh, many liberties in painting the uh, some of the Nazis as not really uh, the leaders of the youth camp, for example, were painted as sort of a kind of a doofus and or goofy, uh, goofy, and they, those goofy. kind of things. So well, well, yeah, but so it, it, that was interesting. But that was a theme throughout. Well, 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 one of the thematic things was if we look at this from the lens of say the therapist lens. Uh, Jojo, we learn as the movie progresses that he has a sister who's died, that his father has been off to war and been absent, and then we ultimately learn that his mom is part of the resistance and is actually um, holding a Jewish girl to keep her safe that was friends with his sister. Right. And so um, we, don't, we, we suddenly begin to have an understanding of why he's so into this Nazi thing. Because it offers a temporary solution, something he can be a part of, something he can invest in, that helps him not to think about all the other things that are broken in his life. Right. Hitler is someone to look up to. He even has him as an imaginary friend and a pal. Right. It fills in all the cracks and all the wounds he's currently experiencing. They get kind of, they get plastered over by this investment in Nazism. And so, as the movie moves forward, forward um more and more cracks in this edifice happen beginning with the fact that he's disfigured at the very beginning um while he's at this camp right um yeah that was the uh grenade episode um or moment in the film where uh it's sort of uh he was going to have a big moment there and kind of show off in front of the others, if I remember. And then uh, he threw that grenade, uh, tried to snatch it out of the hand and run with it and hit it, and it came back. And he ended up standing next to it where the and it blew him up. Of, yeah, it blew him up for real. And, uh, <laughs> That's interesting. He did <laughs> just enough to scar him, though. Right. Right. Okay. Now we could argue, if you want to look at this from a psychologic lens, that he need some of his scars need to move to the outside for him to be able to actually deal with them. So maybe this there was there was something um, hmm. okay. we could almost look at as the grenade as a little like a therapy intervention. It was it was an interpretation from the real that began something. Mm-hmm. If nothing else, it sort of isolated him from the whole Nazi ideology, and suddenly he was more on the outside in. Right, not as pure, mm-hmm. not as perfect, that kind of thing. All right, and then the second event is when he discovers the Jewish girl in his house. Right. She hid away in, right. in a little space uh, that uh, 
where she had enough to live inside, and the mother was actually mm-hmm. helping her with food and so forth. And so, and one of the uh, one of the really uh, moments in the film is he's asking her he's going to write a book, which is called "You Who Jew," <laughs> which you know, catchy title. Yeah. But uh, he asked for he wants he's going to write this book, and he wants her to 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 tell him where the Jews are, so right. they can find them and they can they can get rid of them. And he hands her the book, and she draws and draws, and when she hands it back, it's a picture of him. And he said, that's a picture of me. He said, that's where they are. They're in your head. And that was a... The, so suddenly, there, it's almost as if, in a way, she begins to operate as his therapist. She begins to generate a series of interventions mm-hmm. by her mere presence, by the impact of her. And then there's another telling scene where she's, she's often sort of telling him all these fanciful stories to feed his narrative that Jews do this, they sleep upside down like bats and whatnot. Right. And then at one point he asks her to draw um, what, um, I can't, the, the context is for her to draw um, someone Jewish or, and, or maybe draw her. And she, she, she draws this lovely picture of, of her, her face, and it's flowing and hands it back to him, and I think he's sort of struck by it, and he says, well, wh- where are the horns? She says, what's underneath the hair? And what I think makes that a really good intervention is, and part of the reason why I titled this podcast this, is that all of us have horns underneath our hair. The very things mm-hmm. that he's mm-hmm. attempting to project out are things he must own himself. Mm-hmm. And the goal is not to be either the Aryan or the Jew, but to realize that there is a brokenness and there's a mixture of both in all of us that some of us have scars on the inside or the outside, but all of us have that. And so her drawing is also an intervention. And then there's a telling scene where um, whatever the, the Nazi interrogators come in and, and they're going through his house and she suddenly, um, um, and they find the book and he's telling, and she claims that she's writing the book, but, and the Nazi guys are looking through the book and they're laughing at all the pictures, mm-hmm. and they come to the picture of the beautiful picture of the girl. And for a brief moment, the laughter stops and the narrative stops. And it's as if at that moment, and then they keep uh, going through the book, and suddenly the narrative changes, and, and this begins to change his conflict with her supposed boyfriend, Nathan. But suddenly the pictures of, Nazis, or of Jews as monsters change, and then they become human. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a very telling moment in the book when suddenly he is faced with the humanity of the other, the beauty of the other, and that's the, that, that is the ultimate intervention. And from that moment on, the narratives changes and shifts. It even changes and shifts for um, the other Nazis because for a brief moment, they had to find a way to reconcile this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think that... That that moment in the film is a reflection that, to some degree, all of us have to go through. How do we find a way to be able to own the things that we've projected, to notice the horns underneath our hair, but also to notice that um, that, that that we're beautiful too, and um, uh, that was maybe her best intervention. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh it's something I think we're we're struggling with a little bit now in in this, and it's just so easy to blame the other because they're not like you. They're out group. They're out of your group. You're in the in group where things are a certain way, and you believe. And I think that's that. I mean, it, it seems to be a that kind of thing uh, has been a theme throughout history, really, um, where we can't really take time to reconcile our own. Um, good and bad within us mm-hmm. um, and so what uh, it, it, and it continues it's always another group that we can hate mm-hmm. and uh, not well, really understand and figure out it, it uh, seems a, to be a theme for us all philosopher Hegel talks about this notion of the master slave dialectic and that um, when, when, they're, when we're in that dialectic that there's both the master the person in control and the slave who does everything for him both of them in a way are trapped by this and in some ways the slave is better off than the master though probably that that's not uh, mm. you wouldn't I wouldn't ask a slave that but right. uh, in Hegelian uh, in what happens is to be able to 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 claim any level of freedom is to be able to own a universal brokenness 
to be able to say that there is no one out there who has the answer. No truth, no with a capital T, that you can fix yourself to and then everything is fine. That there is a brokenness and that we have to find a way to be able to live with our own and the brokenness of others and the world. And therein lies a crushing and difficult freedom. Right. We are all... Um, we are all cursed with it. Uh, you are free because you have no choice. Mm-hmm. But all of us run from that. And, yeah, seems to be a natural thing to push against it. And yeah. if you can think about the, the anti-Semitism had been embedded in Europe for a long time, so it wasn't like the Germans invented invented it. But um, uh, anti-Semitism became sort of their cure. It became their way of being able to... Um, to not have to deal with their own brokenness. World War I had, had impacted them in such a way, and it was such a, you know, you mm-hmm. could blame on all our problems are because we have an enemy within. Mm-hmm. And the fact that the movie even says this, you know, what makes the Jews so dangerous is they could look like anybody. Right. Right. They could look like us. <laughs> right. Fact, yes. And, but notice if your goal is to be able to not own your freedom, your own brokenness, that is the scariest thing. They mm-hmm. could look like us. They could even be us, mm-hmm. and that suddenly, if you're not able, because it mounts that right. fear for sure. And but keeps notice it how, that way. when you said that, there, that's almost a place of growth to be able to say, well, they could look like anybody, they could be us, and then if you could take that next step and say, uh oh, maybe we're all in the same boat together, but wow. instead, you ramp up the, um, you begin to burn books. And you right, to, that was portrayed in the movie yeah. as well, right? And then right. you begin, boom. And so you can literally see sort of his movement. And, um, uh, and then by the end, we even see where for a brief moment he tells her that uh, the Germans won and she's going to have to stay. And his motivation then is probably because he doesn't want her to leave. Right. He's found a way, you know. Uh, and he can see her reaction. He can see the pain this brings her, and as a result, he can't stick with this narrative. He has to find a way to, 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 and so he tells her, or he actually walks her outside, and she sees the flags, and, and then, right, so as there, there literally is a movement from the very beginning where he's standing in the mirror, and he's trying to be the best Nazi he can be, to where he is looking at the face of another human being. And the movement between those two points, there's the narrative arc. And at the end, he accepts his brokenness and his freedom. And it is scary because she could leave him. The movie stops. His mom right. is dead. We don't know if his father's coming back. His father may be dead. She may leave him. By accepting that, he literally does enter a world where he does not know what's going to happen. It begins with a world that he does. Jews are bad. Hitler's great. We're going to win the war to a place that is very precarious. And I think mm-hmm. that is a journey, I think Hegel would say that all of us has to have to go for us to, we, we all have to at some point accept our Nazism and then to be able to make that leap into the unknown that happens at the end of the film. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a real journey too. And it just seems like in, in the explanation of this that it's um, so much easier and almost a mindless thing to join the group, uh, to go along with whatever the thoughts and the guidelines are for your particular group and cast other people in a bad light and get mm-hmm. to and move up the hate. Uh, well, level, so to speak. I think this what, what makes this even more insidious is this. Even um, um, there's a famous quote by um, by Oscar Wilde, and it says, uh, um, um, "Whenever one of your friends succeeds, a small part of you dies." Okay. <laughs> and wow. all right. We have to. <laughs> Do we have to? I mean, can't we just be happy for our friend well, who's making progress? Of some but sort? but no. I think what Wilde wants to talk about it is, and I think in, in the age of social media and Facebook and whatnot, like yeah. it's often difficult to be, you know, sitting there on Monday morning and 
turning on Facebook while you're eating your Kashi cereal and your friend is just taking a is taking a trip to you know to Italy and you can he's uh, getting on Italy in the plane and he's sitting there next to you know his perfect family. I'm so happy everything's working. <laughs> and yeah, there you are. And then for a brief moment, <laughs> you're hoping the plane crashes. <laughs> I hope you just for that though. Yeah, take this. Um, yeah, that, that's understanding. But uh, well, listen, that's uh, to evolve to the point where you're happy for your friend mm-hmm. and you can you can not be sort of depressed or let down by that I mean maybe that's the goal maybe we need to figure well, out how do we can celebrate everyone see, else's this, life when they're this is progress, why this right? you know like uh, the provocative title of we're all Nazis is important because I don't think we evolve out of that I think we have to learn to be able to first accept the fact that we will always or at least sometimes be moved to where we want others to suffer in a way that eases our suffering and I think that is part of what it is, when I say constitutive, it's part of what is and makes us who we are. The goal is to be able to dance with it, right. to be able to right. honor the fact that you feel that for a moment. And then there is, just like the arc in the movie, you have to be, you have to live that arc in the moment over your Kashi cereal to <laughs> be able to be real enough to accept, okay, okay. And then I might be able to truly allow my friend his enjoyment or his success. Right. A, small, a small part of me may need to die in order for me to be alive. Wilde wouldn't say that because I think he was being you know, arch and ironic, but right. there's a truth in that, especially in the age of FOMO, especially in the age of social media, especially in the age that um, there is a weaponization, of, a narcissistic weaponization yes. of, of, of interaction. Because, right, we talked about canceling people on right? one show, you know, you cancel them out. And, you know, many of us are going to post something on Facebook with at least the unconscious hope that people are going to be envious. We want to stir hey, something. Hey, look at the, me over here yeah. kind of thing, yeah. Okay. And so how do, we, how do we maintain our humanity in the face of this, both the one who wants to stir envy and the one who is going to have to live with its impact? And I think embedded in that narrative of, of Jojo Rabbit is that very thing. Like that, the narrative arc of the film is the one that, in a way, all of us go through, maybe even daily. How do we be hmm. able to navigate the impact of the other, own our projections, allow ourselves to embrace the horns underneath our hair, but also to be able to embrace the fact that we have hair at all? Okay. Okay. Well, that seems to be a, a, a struggle, though. Uh, I mean, isn't it just easier to be in the camp and we're right and they're wrong? And uh, we kind of uh, move through life in that way. And it sounds like that's going on now, particularly in our political world. We seem to be uh, kind of facing the pointing the finger at the other and blaming and so forth. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, how do you get to that point of some insight? And we talked about this kind of mm-hmm. thing before, where it's, it's education, but it's education and psychology about yourself in some mm-hmm. ways to figure out mm-hmm. what kind of person you want to be and whether you uh, you sort of buy into the sort of almost simple mm-hmm. uh, remedy for your problems is to blame someone else. Uh, well, you know, there's a camp by the name of Mike Eigen, and he has a, he talks about how do we we have to learn to live with the impact of other people and we have to learn to live with the various infinities that we have what he means by that i think is we um when we have that impact of the other whenever we move to a place of feeling and affect for a brief moment is it's an infinity it's something that we have to that we feel and live forever in that moment and we can quickly attempt to shut it down we can quickly attempt to do something with the things that we feel And that gives us back to that notion of affect modulation. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way to be, as we're eating our cereal with the Kashi cereal, we we have to find a way to be able to live with the infinity of envy that results from the impact of the other. Um, Because that can can happen every day, you were saying. I think think there is, one of my favorite cats, Heinz Coet, Father of Self Psychology, talks about how that you know that we um, Winnicott calls an impingement, hmm. but there is a way in which others affect our homeostasis. They they pull us out of that balance too much, too little, and our ability to to do something with that and to continue to grow in our hmm. impact is important. So it would it would be easy. I mean, um, if if 
it would be easy to be a Nazi. I mean, at least for a few years there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so good afterwards. But no. because you had it all figured out. You right. had an enemy. You had an you had enemy. You could blame every problem on the other. Okay. You were perfect. I mean, it's, it literally is a – and we can see it reflected in our, our current political climate. We can, we can build a wall, and if we do that, things are going to be okay. Right. But let's assume that wall were to get built. Exactly. And by the way, it, it, it was never quite the way it was. I mean, but let, and Mexico's going to pay for it. Okay, once you've built it, you still have to, to be able to live with the things that generated the symptom to begin with. Right. You're still right. going to have the unemployment. You're still going to have the fact that the world is changing. You're going to have the fact that there are all sorts of dangerous things we have to deal with. Um, in some ways, it would be great if we could forever delay building the wall. Right. So if we could have a wall that we could just never act, but we want but never build, and well, maybe sounds like about what's going on right now. <laughs> then maybe that would extent. keep us, you know, from and from asking larger questions like, who are these people we're trying to keep keep out? Right. And oh, we've already painted those. Or at least the right. political side has painted those. Who are they life. really? Why do they want to get here? What sort of world do we live in where you have to build a wall to keep people out? I mean, you begin to have to accept a level of freedom and universal brokenness that would cascade, and you have to begin to think, oh, right? Right. That yeah, you play that out, and of course, uh, you set up this world where there's all this division between people, and you're on one side and they're on the other. And that just doesn't have a happy ending, it doesn't seem like. There's always a revolt of the people who have been uh, disrespected and, and cast mm -hmm. in this light. There's always mm -hmm. a fight. There's always a war. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't sound like there's a, good in, uh, yeah, there's a good ending to it, and maybe we need to figure out how to help people understand that they have to deal with both sides of this and, and internally both mm -hmm. sides of this with their own day-to-day -day work. Well, I think that's, that's the point of Vulcan's book, the need to have enemies, like... We, um, um, if, if do we need an enemy? I mean, I understand this, uh, the point there. You maybe you meant enemies, but, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, but, uh, That's we all need those. But, uh, <laughs> Not that I set that up, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. well, I think his point would be is that um, an enemy may be a necessary step in our narrative. Okay. Like, if Jojo Rabbit didn't have some Nazist stuff, if, if Nazism wasn't something he could hold on to, maybe he would have fallen apart. Right. Maybe the full impact of all his losses and all his feelings would have overwhelmed him. So it, it yeah. isn't... It becomes a defense. Right. So, much, yeah. so maybe we need the, the enemy at some point in our narrative, but we don't need to be stuck with that. Right. And I think that is something kind of the usefulness mm -hmm. of an enemy we don't need it too mm -hmm. long we don't need to stay in that state too long we need to move through and and somehow manage it on a mm -hmm. like you said a day-to-day -day basis even because notice how if if we're not careful there's a the this it's a side of the same coin but if we move to a place where um where we don't allow ourselves like if you're eating your bowl of kashi and you are um, in a state of um, of some sort of narrow happiness, right? Like you are constantly monitoring the thoughts and feelings you have, so you only have a certain few. Oh, and, okay. You know, that is uh, if and Nazis were a variant of fascism. That's just a cuddly form of fascism. Right. That is that is also uh, damning. That is also a place of non-growth. Um, and we could, it, on the left especially, that could be a place you could find yourself at, right? That you could... Um, yeah, almost inactivity. You're just kind of mm -hmm. sitting there. I mean, you have to make some movement in life. You have to grow. You have to do those things. Well, oh, well, yeah. well politically, what if, what if we saw that, okay, so we have no borders and we let everyone in. Okay. And we feed them and all that sort of stuff. The other, yeah, but what if we didn't ask the big question then, well, why do they want to come here to begin with? Mm-hmm. And then we may want to ask the question, what is it about global capitalism? What is it about our, 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 our economic needs that are making folks below us miserable? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is possible that if, if we don't begin to ask those questions, like um, um, 
I saw this on a meme this morning when somebody okay. said, you know, um, that they're, hey, you know what I'm doing to save the planet? I am, um, I'm, uh, I changed my oil and I'm taking my oil over to the recycling place and things are going to end. And the guy says, well, that's wonderful. But last time, I, I said, he said, but I don't know about you, but I didn't uh, drop 50 million gallons of oil in, in the ocean. And, he, and, and the idea behind that is, is that, okay, it's good that he's doing that, but the people who are really making the largest impact are the global corporations right. that no one is holding to, uh, uh, to task for. And so as long as we don't – so the other trap would be not to ask the bigger questions that we need to ask to be able to make the sort of change that may need to happen. Right, and that's a that's a tough assignment for us to sort of really look in the mirror and make some uh, – bring up those tough questions for ourselves and what kind of person do we want to be and what kind of group do I want to be in. It almost seems too – and I know we've talked about this before, but – why do we why do we set these boundaries up in the first place? And it, it almost kind of comes back to fear. <laughs> like we we need this closeness, this connection with a with a group, and that we will be accepted in. And it, and uh, and if we start to figure out that we need to think about other people and their points of view and understand why people are coming to the, con- the country and want to come here, that. Uh, Wait a minute. There's a fear that uh, we may lose what we have, or we're giving up something, or we're mm-hmm. not going to win. Mm-hmm. And I think the lo- win lose idea too kind of pops in there. But isn't there just sort of a basic fear? If it's not just not being educated enough, I guess in some way psychology wise, to uh, to to uh, really try to understand those ideas and bring them into our thought process. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot, lot there going on. It may be just at the bottom line. There's just fear of disintegration, fear of losing. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, uh, Coet talks. He, he he calls it annihilation anxiety. That at the core of us, that there is um, a deep need to maintain the balance so that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And at the core of all, and for him, all of us have uh, are on a narcissistic continuum. And that's the basis for all narcissistic action. Anything that begins, uh, a d- it's a desperate need to shore up the self in the face of this potential inner implosion. Okay. And that um, uh, m- if we're lucky, we win the genetic lottery and we have the right sort of environment to where this becomes a minimal concern. But for many of us, it's not. Mm-mm. For many of us, it's, you know... Um, and I think that's part of what makes, again, not to get political, but for a lot of folks sure. on the left, Trump so traumatic. He seems right. to be bringing into the into the um, political discourse a um, um, an angry, uh, an energy, uh, a darkness, a sense right. that um, you know this is something is not right. And uh, right. I, I think to some degree, maybe. This reflects some of his own disequilibrium, and that his solution mm-hmm. to his maintaining a sense of self has been problematic for other people in the past, and sure. maybe problematic for us as a, a nation. I think that would probably be the uh, yeah. Uh, and and in some ways, also w- one way to deal with that is to project it out onto others, mm-hmm. um, and put your wagons in a circle and get your small group or mm-hmm. in a larger group now to uh, to go along with you on those things. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an interesting place we find ourselves, but mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, I'm I'm just uh, I'm a little um, interested in the fact that you haven't brought up Jizak into this conversation, I and I, I don't could. know why that is. But he said you you said in one of our last episodes that uh, you know we needed this in order to. And I took it to be s- sort of correct, self-correct, or course-correct uh, for us there. So. Oh, Trump? As yeah, a yeah, yeah, that's what we were well, thinking. Yeah I, yeah, I think that for Zizek and company, the idea that um, um, uh, liberalism has its limits and that there is something um, uh, secretly insidious about it and that um, uh, neoliberalism especially – because it really touts and drives this notion of individuality mm-hmm. and the pursuit of individual freedom. And that um, if we're not careful, this is an ideology that will lead us to um, um, either A, consume until the planet's destroyed, 
or B, into the false narrative that if we do something individually, that's going to change the course we're on, and that what that requires is us to be able to move past this individual notion and to be able to think about ourselves as a collective, as a community, as each other. And that, um, you know, um, we, uh, we don't do that. Okay, I'm, so, I'm, I'm just, I'm sort of thinking now that uh, we're in this paradigm where there's no solution here and uh, um, it's it, you're either the individual or you're with the collective and uh, so and can't you have one foot in on well, both of those uh, the catch would be is if, if both of them and this is how ideology works to a degree if both of them seem like the perfect solution then you're screwed yeah that's right never buy because, that All right, right because if nothing else communism has taught us that you know a bunch of people getting together is not always the best thing on the planet. <laughs> and <laughs> but we're always searching for this right. ideal. We want the truth with a capital T, as you you said. Well, and, and, and Hegel so. and Zizek himself would say that the you know the, the truth is is that there is a um, is contradiction. Uh, Zizek's quoting Lacan: "The big other doesn't exist. There's right. not someone or something out there that has the answers and is going to fix everything." Right, that's almost a childhood sort of fantasy in a way. But Maybe we, it came up. Uh, we kick that can further down yeah. the road, though, because we're all, you know, we're still looking for. We're trying to figure you know. out the yeah, but but it is looking for an ideal, and and um, gosh, uh, I mean, it's a letdown that there's not an ideal. I think that that may have something to do with some of our religious beliefs and so mm-hmm. forth in our society. So, um, but and, notice how that it's possible though that. By, we're about to hit the Christmas season. We should do a Santa episode because it, that okay. narrative, because it's All the right, very, we go. the very act. Are you going to kill Santa? Well, Is that what actually, we're doing? the very act of realizing that Santa doesn't exist actually allows you to enjoy Christmas and Santa even more. Okay. All right. There is. The, <laughs> I don't know if you're going to tell that to a bunch of kids out there waiting for well, those presents under the tree, but no, I think I'm understanding where you're going. Because you know, it, it suddenly becomes um, you can participate in the game of 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 Christmas and Santa in ways that you can't when you were both the parent trying to hide this fact from the child. And the child trying to hide the fact from the parent that he knows the Santa. They already exist. know. <laughs> that's that's and really so, an interesting but, idea. To, but notice how. But by the way, this is a big spoiler <laughs> alert for all any kid yeah, yeah. that's watching. And this, Santa's but, a Nazi. That guy. Was, oh, there we go. <laughs> he was. That is. <laughs> be honest, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, we just crushed the dreams of about a million kids out there. But, hey, that's okay. We're trying to get to what's, how to better understand what's going on here. But no, no, so. notice how that, that, that is a narrative that if you, can, if you can move through it, there's the possibility of enjoying in a way that you couldn't before. Right. And there's something about that, too. Yeah, that's kind of an yeah. example of how to mm-hmm. get through some of this. Mm-hmm. That it's not all bad when you suddenly uh, realize that you're mm-hmm. – uh, the thing that you held up so so much mm-hmm. um, it's not necessarily uh, doesn't affect the, having a good life and enjoying yourself so hey that's interesting. and we just say that I was going to work in a joke here about erectile dysfunction it was really funny but it was really inappropriate right well I, I'm um, first of all I want to thank you for that <laughs> yeah, you yeah. didn't bring that up and on the other hand man I wish I'd have heard that joke too so there you go you, you push and pull do I really want to hear that joke maybe I should right. okay there you go all right well <laughs> It it just seems it's it's um, always a, it's a struggle being human, okay. So, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not that, sure that everybody's up for this task. It, it's funny because we we talk about that guy Hegel, and I've been reading a lot of these post Hegelians lately. Because you know what, yep. what else should you do on a Saturday morning but read some post Hegelian philosophy? Okay. But there's a famous right. saying by by Hegel that says, "Substance is subject. It may not be easy being matter." Right. <laughs> Because okay, now we get into the Einsteinian uh, well, view of uh, all of this. There is an element Energy of conflict matter. and contradiction inherent in existence, period. I right. mean, this yeah. table will not be a table forever. In fact, I don't know where you got this thing. Well, actually, this but, will be forever. I've, I've tried to lift it. it uh, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so it, it may be here it long may, after maybe. us, but I'm pretty sure. So it isn't easy being human, but it may right. be part of what we, we, we could even – Expand ourselves to think. Well, you know, it isn't even. It isn't easy easy to be in any way. To right. be constituted is to be in flux. Is to be impermanent. 
Oh, the impermanence to, of it yeah. all. Oh, okay. And there so, you know, that there is, you know, and part of what drives, if wanting to get existential about it is, put, you know, not just the, the maintaining of self, but also the maintaining the self against the as, being assailed by impermanence, by yeah. change, by all that sort of right. stuff. Death. Right. Well, there you the, the, the D word. The D word, I know. Yeah. I use it. I shouldn't have. It brings up something I'm sure you're going <laughs> to begin no, to no, talk no. about there. I did. Death is fun is the next I, episode, I have, by the way. <laughs> Here we go. I have blamed my ED on existential crisis. That is it's, it's my fear of death. <laughs> I think that's a go-to, isn't it? I mean, just about everything. I, I, I would not have done that if it hadn't been for you know my fear of death. Uh, yeah, so it's a str- it's a struggle. Didn't do it in this case. Okay, yeah, that in that case. Yeah. <laughs> well, ooh, that was that joke kind of came back on us. Um, so, uh, well, I, I kind of wonder. I don't. I don't. I mean, being human and trying to figure out what's going on in our lives, and uh, you know, facing some of those existential questions and. Uh, mortality and all of those things that we don't have i mean all right so how do we live our lives day to day it seems like this is a struggle heroin okay no 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 <laughs> no no we're not it's, we're not, not going down that road yeah. but uh, yeah uh, it's almost like we in, in some in some way we want to strive for simplicity we don't mm. want things to be complicated we'd rather live this sort of simple life and uh you see on the commercials on TV, and you see all these wonderful things that they depict for us, and in movies as well, mm-hmm. that, uh, wow, how wonderful it can be. And then there's always this tragedy, almost in every movie, and even cartoons, and even mm-hmm. in things with uh, for kids, it seems like. They, they mm-hmm. arc uh, toward uh, the tragic moment, and something has to be reconciled and, and uh, completed. Mm-hmm. So, but that's... I don't know. That's life, maybe. Well, well, maybe if if we look at our man Jojo as sort of a a uh, a model, uh, there is a stumbling through. There is an openness to continue to stumble and move, to get lost and to be found, to oscillate between those two points, which what he did in the film until he finally got to a place of some potential, and it wasn't resolution. But it was to the point at which he could be open to whatever may happen next. Because, again, the movie ends with, we don't know what's going to happen. Right. His, his future is uncertain. He's about to be thrust into a world where he may have no one. Maybe. Yeah, it looked like that with his mother's uh, death and um, father may not come back home, those kind of things. So, on his own. But on the other hand, they, they were uh, the U.S. troops were there and, and uh, the war was shifting and uh, maybe coming to an end. So, there was a bit of positive stuff going on. So, that, you know, well, it was positive for her, but, you know, one of his friends says, you know, it's not really good right now to be a Nazi. And um, he, he literally went from a place of, of, of desperate need for certainty by joining to, at the end, a, an existential leap of sorts into a certain unknown. And that may be what needs to happen to all of us when we're, uh, you know, in front of our, our Kashi cereal on Facebook. Right. How do we move? How when do your we friends mo- going to Italy on a yeah. great vacation that with bastard. a perfect family? Right. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Past you. I, uh, okay, yeah. you're going to be okay, though. Hey. I hope, you know what? What? I hope he gets ED. No, no, that's <laughs> not what you want to wish. <laughs> uh, only temporarily. Now you got to jump out of that. I, I'm just following what you said, yeah, yeah, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, hope he, you so know. Come, come back and wish him the best. And uh, uh, maybe yeah. one day you can have that trip to Italy. <laughs> yeah, maybe, well, uh, yeah, I guess that would be. But see, even, notice how even one day I could have the trip could be. Another way to avoid the true impact of this. Right. That in this moment... Just roll with it. There is somebody who has something to look forward to that you don't. He's got a better situation than you have right now. Right. Live with it. Deal with it. It might be a bet, I mean, you know what? <laughs> you know, Mondays... It's part of being a mature adult. It is. You know, it accepting. is part of... It, it is, you know, and there is uh, allowing... It, and, and that would be what Eigen talks about is allowing yourself the impact and living with the infinity of it. You know? Right. Okay. Um, this is it now, is. You don't want that to happen all the time, however. Don't you want to be on the plane and or on the vacation well, or something? I, Sometimes, and that that'll balance things out. So, good things happening to you, good things happening for your friend. It's not always a struggle. You're I just want to be, okay, be eating my weight of with, with with buffalo wings at Hooters. That's really all I need, what? right? <laughs> that is That's not all I can true. eat. 
All right, you've just uh, you just violated all of the vegan rules. That's uh, right, sorry, yeah. Chicken That's wings, all you can eat chicken wings. <laughs> yeah, it's not no. pretty rough <laughs> <laughs> on occasion, but um, yeah. So, but good things are going to happen. So let's uh, let's not go uh, too too far in there. Acceptance of that, the the struggle with it, and uh, kind of coming out and and being happy for your friend yeah, or like you the just, others around. You you open up your phone and you look at your Hooters app and you realize that how many Hooters locations there are in the world, <laughs> and you could that makes it a little easier, right? There are, you know, thirty two thousand by the way. Oh, you actually know that. So <laughs> I, I was afraid, I was thinking, oh, he has a Hooters app. That is not that's not a good thing. Um, but you maybe know. there's another app on there. Maybe it's a meditation app, and uh, there it is. one of those that you can yes, just kind of take yeah. a moment and say everything's okay. And uh, yeah, and, and in the meditation, that. the Hooters meditation app, you just count wings. You go, know, <laughs> and then slowly but surely you count to okay. you count wings. All right. Well, the, you know, some of the things we talked about is a struggle of being a human being and sort of facing mm-hmm. this adversity and uh, maybe not allowing yourself to fall into one of these groups where, mm-hmm. okay, we're good, they're bad. But it mm-hmm. seems like that's an ongoing situation in our, in our world. We, we have competition. There is competition out there. And, uh, you know, win, win, lose. You brought up from a kid, you're playing on a ball team, you're going to learn, in, in learning how to lose and mm-hmm. being okay with that is a kind of a, a big lesson for kids. And uh, the idea that we're facing this almost on a daily basis is what I hear you saying. Yeah, it, 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 and this is, I keep using that word, uh, that it is constitutive, that it may be the price we pay for being subjects, for being aware. The table goes through the same thing that I will go through, it will dissolve. Right. It will be effaced. It will be erased from history. But the table doesn't know that. And the price we pay for being sentient, for the capacity for self-reflection and subjecthood, you. that may be the entry fee. Yeah, and, consciousness, you know, uh, the awareness of to it. To quote a Spoon song, that's just the rent I pay. It's just the rent you pay. Mm-hmm. All right, all right, well... Um, Everybody got to pay the rent. We, <laughs> yeah, we do. As a matter of fact, and uh, so yeah, that's that's it's kind of a, I don't know, is this uplifting or is it just like this is the thing we need well, to know? I mean, uh, if we go back to our film, look at all the rent he had to pay. He had to um, he, he had to have his heart broken, and he also at least at some point had to be able to enter a world where he didn't know what was going to happen next, mm-hmm. and. He, I think there is more to life than just those two points, though he was, you know, living in Nazi Germany and eating out of trash cans at one point after his mom died. But I do believe that there is the potential for joy and connection. There is the potential to have a lived life and to be alive, and that it is possible in, 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 if, um, to uh, quote Winnicott, that the act of accepting this, paying your rent and accepting it, may free you up to go on being in some ways that allow you to have a lived life. So I do think there is something to this. Jojo Rabbit at the end is capable now of being loving both to himself and the world that he wasn't before. Right. And I think there's far more joy in that. The ecstatic yes. joy of throwing grenades and killing rabbits, um, I think that is a different sort of thing to the openness of heart and the joy of connection to himself and others in the world that he would have at the end of this. Okay. I like the way you say that. I need to pause it right there. But, you know, um, I I will also say that this movie, very interesting movie, a lot of uh, satirical work going on, a lot of poking fun at uh, Mm -hmm. at Nazis and other Mm -hmm. kinds of things. The characters were just really beyond the pale and uh, Mm -hmm. funny. And mm-hmm. this, so there's a lot of humor. So maybe that's one of the things that happened with this movie is that they, they used a sort of a foundation of uh, humor throughout this to get to those more serious mm-hmm. points. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that's that's mm-hmm. about literature and art and music mm-hmm. and all the other things too. And beauty. Yeah. That's the the moment that he was able to see the beautiful picture amidst all the ugliness. Yeah, I thought I thought about the the idea that uh, he sort of fell in love, right? Mm-hmm. So love sort of conquers some of this mm-hmm. thing. Dude. Mm-hmm. There's no phrase, but uh, more love, less hate. 
bumper sticker? Mm-hmm. Or um, how about um, learn learn to do something with your hate so you can love a little better? All right, it's a little a little too long for that bumper sticker, uh, but but uh, we we can shorten it. This is certainly a T-shirt, if not a, mm-hmm. a bumper sticker. I kind of like that idea. We can kind of stay with that for a little bit. And uh, but uh, so you would recommend this movie? I I, I would. It's uh, yeah. I, I think it's a movie worth seeing. I think it's anything. So it's, okay. it's not as good as the lighthouse. Okay, wait or, a second. Uh, <laughs> no, no, we're you're not going to bring up these two movies and compare these two movies. Or, uh, we talked about the lighthouse. I'm still traumatized uh, from that. This one, I'm, I felt okay. I had a sense of hope and uh, things were going to work out uh, we work through it and humor allows us to watch this and sort of mm-hmm. take it in and maybe that's one way to connect with those, those folks who are in the groups and uh, they're, they're sort of uh, uh, isolated from understanding what's sort of going on with the others so mm-hmm. I like it alright final word on uh, on Jojo Rabbit or maybe you've already made it I yeah uh, alright is there any other movies we need to see and, and sort of there's a um, movie thing for the last a number of episodes. Yeah, there, here, there are a couple so. of movies coming coming through the pipe. We'll 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 we'll, we'll, we'll see them. We'll All see. right, that's what that's what we'll do. Um, actually, the the uh, Mr. Rogers movie that's coming out is actually about um, hmm. uh, someone. Um, it's actually not so much about him, but it's about the guy and. He's sort of an investigative journalist who's well, trying to uncover something, right? I, think he's, I, I get that. I didn't. He's read been much wounded about it. by his relationship with his dad, and he's sort of experiencing a level of cynicism. And so, um, it's about his impact and encounter and collision with Mister Rogers, and what that may or may not do to him. Uh huh. All right, kind of like it. I want to go see that one. There. All right, thanks, folks. We'll see you next time. <laughs>